Next on Current News, the coronavirus continues to take lives. Now the federal government stepping in to help pay for funeral arrangements. Plus, more lives lost in a mass shooting at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Police still trying to figure out why. Then the Vatican is hosting an international conference on health and medicine, and some very famous faces will be taking part. And happy birthday, Pope Emeritus, as Benedict XVI makes a little birthday history. The news starts right now. Hello, I'm Christine Persichetti. If you lost a family member to COVID-19, you may qualify to have some funeral expenses paid back. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, is working to take some financial weight off of grieving families. Jessica Easthope has more on how people can get reimbursed. FEMA is taking applications from people who lost loved ones to COVID-19 and had that burden of an expensive and maybe unexpected funeral cost. They could now be reimbursed up to $9,000. It's just gut-wrenching to realize that there are thousands of people, bodies, lying in morgues, not being buried properly. On Monday, Senator Chuck Schumer and Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez held a news conference in Corona Plaza to lay out the ground rules for the program and why it matters so much to this immigrant-rich neighborhood. This program is one of the first programs that will allow mixed status and undocumented families to get some semblance of relief. According to the program, people can get reimbursed for expenses during every stage of the funeral process, from transportation to identify a loved one's remains to the purchase of a burial plot. As long as you're able to show a copy of a death certificate showing the primary or contributing cause of death was COVID-19, as well as proof of funeral expenses like receipts and contracts dated January 20th, 2020 and after. People can be reimbursed for expenses from that date until December 31st of last year. And as for COVID deaths now, people can get the help as they need it. Those now who can't afford a funeral can get the money to pay for it on into the future. Lawmakers say this program won't undo the damage done by the pandemic, but it will help the New Yorkers who need it most. We can organize collectively, build community power, and we can get the justice that families deserve. Father Manuel de Jesus Rodriguez, the pastor of Our Lady of Sorrows Church in Corona, had at least 100 parishioners die of COVID-19. He says his predominantly undocumented parish is in desperate need of the program. And this is going to be wonderfully uh, helping them to move forward uh, in, their, in their lives as families, struggling families in this neighborhood. Many of them are still uh, um, out of job, uh, jobless. The unemployment rates in Brooklyn and Queens are both hovering around 13 percent. Lawmakers encourage everyone to gather their paperwork and make that call to FEMA. In Corona, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. FEMA will also provide assistance in other areas. It will cover transfer of remains, casket, clergy services, use of funeral home equipment or staff, cremation and headstone costs. There's been another mass shooting, this time at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. According to authorities, eight people were shot and killed overnight on Thursday. Several others are hospitalized. The coroner's office has yet to identify the victims as investigators searched the gunman's home for a motive. The shooter opened fire in the parking lot, then moved indoors before taking his own life. And in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, there's a memorial at the site where Dante Wright was killed by police during a traffic stop, prompting protests to erupt in the streets. One Lutheran church at the center of the calls for justice decided to offer a place for mourning and reflection, along with food, water, and a little hope. We're praying for everyone, and we're praying for just solutions and peace. And this is our little way of showing our love. The former Brooklyn Center police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright appeared in court this week and is currently out on bail. Now to the situation at the southern border. Despite promises to increase refugee admissions to 60,000 this year, President Joe Biden is keeping the 15,000 limit set by the Trump administration. This as migrants continue to cross the southern border. The Catholic organization Hope Border Institute says the journey has been challenging for the migrants, but the agency is there to provide them with hope. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has restricted travel just about everywhere, with the exception of the border between the United States and Mexico. Migrants continue to arrive there. Many have endured dangerous journeys that have left them destitute, and now they're facing even greater challenges at the border due to the pandemic. Here, uh, like other parts of the border, we've seen exceptionally high um, uh, infection rates. We've seen a lot of death. Um, uh, we've seen terrible un economic un uh, fallout. Um, and then it's also driven immigration. Pope Francis repeatedly calls for immigration reform that respects the dignity of migrants. In 2016, he celebrated mass in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, only 50 yards away from the U.S. border. I remember when he came here to the U.S.-Mexico border um, and brought a message of compassion and hope, um, but also a challenging message, a challenging message that we should not be building walls. This is not a time for wall building. This is a time for bridge building. Um, and, and so that leadership, I think, I think it's, it, it's making a difference. Pope Francis's message of hope is a source of inspiration to those working to assist migrants. They share his vision for borders to be spaces of mutual enrichment and communion in diversity. I think that that's what the U.S.-Mexico border can be. It can be a place of encounter. It can be a place of compassion. It can be a place of mercy. Um, and we can build a system, uh, a worldwide system of immigration um, and protection for people on the margins, protection for people who are seeking asylum um, that's worthy of human dignity and, and worthy of the, the calling that God is, is making to us through migrants. Coming up next week, we will have an inside look at the situation at the southern border. National correspondent for the tablet and crux, John Lavenberg, will be there and will join us with full reports. At the Vatican, Pope Emeritus Benedict the 16th is celebrating his birthday. He's the first Pope to reach the age of 94. But because of the pandemic, Benedict will celebrate the special day privately without any festivities. According to his personal secretary, the Pope Emeritus often jokes about his age, saying he never expected to live this long. There's a lot more news headed your way. Life under Taliban rule will bring you inside Afghanistan's living situation now that American troops are leaving the country. And Dr. Anthony Fauci will be part of a Vatican summit to discuss the latest breakthroughs in medicine and health care. Plus, Catholic students around the diocese have made it to the finish line as the tablet newspaper's COVID relief fundraiser comes to a close. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Major news for the nation this week as President Biden announces U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by September 11th. The date marks 20 years since the 2001 terror attacks. Biden's plan begins on May 1st, keeping with a U.S. exit deadline negotiated by the Trump administration with the Taliban last year. The Afghan president said he spoke with Biden and respects the decision. And as America's longest war finally comes to an end, we're taking an inside look at Afghanistan, a reminder of what life under Taliban control looks like. Now that America is leaving Afghanistan after nearly two decades of blood lost, many wonder what world is left behind for ordinary Afghans. Taliban stronghold Musakala is where many American and British soldiers died. Now it's a snapshot of how the Taliban will run Afghanistan. Six men living there talk about what it's like. In short, bleak for women, a few smartphones, but for all, Taliban justice and Taliban taxes. There are consequences. If you don't pay, they beat you or imprison you. Taliban roam the market U.S. Marines once patrolled 10 years ago. The Americans were based here on a location you can see on this satellite image, not far from the empty shop where the Taliban have their temporary courts, which they call the room, dispensing swift, brutal justice. Punishments depend on what the other side wants. If the plaintiff forgives a murderer, the court might not give a death sentence. But if the relatives demand it, they may. Few women are allowed on the streets. They still don't go to school. Nobody even dares to ask about that. They are not allowed to do business outside their house. When they go out, they need to dress according to Sharia law. So for them, 
it's more important to take care of their homes than working outside. The Taliban sets taxes from opium, harvest or shops. But some said when different Taliban groups feud, people can pay more than once. Many people have been taken to the Taliban room, locked up for a night or two, or have been beaten up. There are different group of Taliban. It would be better to have a single authorized official getting tax, but every group tries to take tax for their own pockets. That's one problem for people now. The U.S. Secretary of State says even with our troops home, the U.S. will continue to invest in and support the Afghan people. The Vatican is sending a message to the Muslim people as they celebrate Ramadan. The month of fasting and prayer began this past Monday. The Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue sent the Muslim believers fraternal good wishes for a month rich in divine blessings and spiritual advancement. The Vatican is also planning a major conference on the priesthood that could bring lasting changes to the Catholic Church. Possible outcomes include increasing vocations to the priesthood and improving the working relationship between lay people and priests. Claudia Torres has more. In February, thousands of people along with a group of bishops will meet at the Vatican to reflect on the foundations of the priesthood. The conference will be organized by the Center for Research and Anthropology of Vocations, presided over by Cardinal Mark Willet. The participants hope to recall the foundation of each vocation which lies in baptism and through which the faithful participate in the mission of the church. We Catholics remained with the priestly ministry and Protestants with the baptismal priesthood. It was necessary to reconcile these perspectives, to integrate them. The Second Vatican Council did just that, but this idea has not yet entered into the life and pastoral care of the church. The conference will be held in Rome from February 17th to the 19th, it is titled Toward a Fundamental Theology of the Priesthood and will be concluded by the Pope. The conference will address questions such as the relationship of the priesthood with other vocations in the church and why priests are asked to be celibate. This is not a symposium on priestly celibacy, as if this question should be fundamentally addressed. It is a broader perspective, starting with baptism. To show future priests the reason that justify the request for celibacy and this life commitment, and to propose to them, consequently and coherently, the most appropriate ways to live this gift with fidelity. Today, in many parts of the world, bishops and priests are seeking to identify what changes are needed for a priest to truly be a sentinel of the kingdom of God, a man called by God to sanctify the world through the gift of the sacraments of the kingdom. The conference also has a dedicated website on which content will be published to prepare for the meetings. Organizers hope that by returning to a theology of the priesthood, a missionary drive will once again be taken up throughout the church. It seems to be an event that will benefit not only priests, but all believers. That was Claudia Torres reporting. Bishop DiMarzio spoke about the upcoming conference, saying the timing is right. There is a... a Bit of, I'd say confusion, but there's a diversity of opinion about really what priestly life is about. And that's based on the theology of priesthood. How do you see the priesthood? That, that makes a difference of how you react to certain things, how you even recruit. So um, it can be helpful if there's a, some clarification or at least a discussion on the concept of priesthood. And uh, it seems like this is a timely thing. Bishop DiMarzio went on to say that a clear program of recruitment is needed going forward. Coming this May, the Vatican is hosting an international event to discuss the latest breakthroughs in medicine and health care. The theme this year is exploring the mind, body and soul. And the Vatican Pontifical Council for Culture invited Dr. Anthony Fauci, Jane Goodall and several other researchers to discuss how to make quality health care available and affordable. The three day conference is scheduled to start on May 6th and will be held online because of the pandemic. The pandemic has affected every aspect of our lives, including the church. Here to imagine what the church might look like in a post-pandemic world is the Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas DiMarzio. He sat down with former tablet editor Ed Wilkinson for this week's Into the Deep. Ed. Thank you. We're going to talk to Bishop DiMarzio today about uh, the pandemic that we're still currently going through in the church. And Bishop, in a recent column in the tablet, you said that we should not look at the pandemic as a punishment for our sins but as an opportunity to do better. What did you mean by that? 
Well, I, I said that in relationship to a survey that had been done that many Christians, including some Catholics, would see it as a sign of God's punishment to us. Uh, God does not punish us in that way. In fact, God does not punish. We punish ourselves by our sins and faults. Uh, the pandemic has come upon us. It's you, probably some human fault involved. There's no question about it. It's not divine intervention in our world trying to put us on the right path, although some places are on the wrong path. Yes, I said that because people can't see God as the author of evil. God allows evil in the world because we are free human beings and we have a choice. We can choose good or evil. Mm -hmm. And sometimes societies, by their actions, choose the wrong thing and they choose evil instead of good. Mm -hmm. Of course, so many people have gotten out of the practice of going to church during the pandemic. Uh, the, the obligation has been lifted for a while. How are we going to get people used to getting back to church now? I know some, pe some numbers are pretty good in our parishes, but they're not what they used to be. How do we get people back into the habit of going to church? I believe those who were going to church will return to church uh, if they're well, if they can. Uh, I don't think it's as big a problem as some might see it. Our real problem is that we have less people going to church in general. You know, our Catholic population in the 50s, there was 50, 60 percent of Catholics who went to Mass every week. Mm -hmm. Now we're down to 25 percent, and that's sometimes intermittent, twice a month uh, or, or so. Uh, that's the real problem, that people don't see the Eucharist as central to their lives. That's what the new evangelization is about. Mm -hmm. Restoring an understanding of what our sacramental system is all about. Yes, people get lazy. Our culture doesn't help us. It's too busy. Especially Sunday, we've killed it as a day of rest and worship. All of this has affected how people's habits. But, you know, bad habits are easy to acquire. Good habits, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So we have to help people acquire the good habit now of relating to the church through the Eucharist. Yeah. Do you think the uh, the church has to get a little bit more creative in how it attracts people? Uh, you often talk about the new evangelization and the uh, obligation to think out of the box sometimes. H how do we begin to think differently about attracting people back into the Catholic Church? I, I think during the pandemic we learned a way of, of live streaming the masses. This, this does allow people who may be afraid to come or a little lazy to come to see what's being said. If we have good preaching, if we understand the world today and relate people to it, they will come back. Mm -hmm. We have to do better. We have to preach better. We have to understand what the problems are. We have to address those problems. That's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a big help, and I think we're started on the right path in the sense I would not stop live streaming. I think it's reaching many people who are not normally coming to church. Let us use all we have, as I said many times, the media today becomes for us that new means of evangelization. Yeah, and you know, you hear some people say, look, if you go to the supermarket or if you go to get your hair cut or you go to the bank, why aren't you coming to church? Is that a valid argument? Well, again, uh, sometimes those, those other uh, visits to things are quicker. They feel, well, if I'm staying in church, we, I have never received any complaint from anybody, and we get lots of complaints, <laughs> that they, re, they got COVID in church. That mm -hmm. has not happened all during this year. No one has ever claimed that. Mm -hmm. So it's not happening in church, it's happening in other places. And of course the churches are going to great lengths to make sure that the, uh, the buildings are sanitized and that uh, the virus is kept right. out of the church. It's costing us a lot of money, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's extra money, obviously, because we're trying to do things the right way. But uh, people should not be afraid to come because there's no, uh, the danger of contagion is, is minimal. Anybody can get it any place. But if you follow the rules, everybody follows the rules, we should do well. Great. Bishop, thanks so much for being with us today. Okay. Uh, Take we're going, care. We're going back now to our news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. Still to come on Currents News, the Tablets COVID relief fundraiser has come to a close. How you can still help out schools in the diocese outside of the competition. And Coney Island is finally up and running again. A look at the park's revival efforts after its year-long hiatus.
Catholic students around the diocese, pencils down. The tablet COVID relief fundraiser is over. Schools throughout Brooklyn and Queens competed to sell the most subscriptions or renewals to the paper. Both the top selling school and the top selling student will get a $3,000 bonus. The month long competition ended Friday, April 16th, but you can still help out the schools outside of the competition. Just go to the tablet.org slash COVID relief fundraiser. There you'll be able to select your parish school and subscribe or extend your subscription. The Wonder Wheel and the Cyclone are up and running as the amusement parks at Coney Island are officially back in business. After a year-long shutdown, the iconic parks are welcoming a third of the guests they normally would under new guidelines. Emily Druby has more on the economic boost to the area. It's been a roller coaster of a year for Coney Island, the pandemic forcing amusement parks to stay closed. But after 13 months, they're back. The opening of Coney Island is a metaphor for New York City. We are getting back in business. Senator Chuck Schumer, Mayor Bill de Blasio, and New York Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul on hand to reopen Luna Park and Dino's Wonder Wheel. And the comeback begins here. It begins here today. A comeback that will affect the entire neighborhood. Last year, they lost $100 million in revenue with the two parks, Aquarium, Amphitheater, and Brooklyn Cyclones Field all closed. Alexandra Silversmith with the Alliance for Coney Island says when these cornerstone places close, it affects the whole area. But they all really are important to each other and that's sort of how Coney Island survives and thrives is if they're all open and operating. Tough for local businesses and for the parks. The partly Catholic family who owns Dino's dipping into their savings to keep the park afloat. But it was a devastatingly hard time. The family, however, was committed to making sure that the park would be here for post-pandemic. And that's why you can see the roller coaster Phoenix rising. The new ride rising, just like Coney Island. It's something they've done before. The economy of Coney Island has been shown to be very resilient and bounce back very quickly. Take Hurricane Sandy, for instance. Coney Island rebuilt in six months, reopened, and entertained millions of people once again. After the 36th annual Blessing of the Rides, Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord. The park was officially open for business, their 100th season. For many, seeing Coney Island reopen and getting back on these rides doesn't just mean that summer is back. It also means that New York City is back. In Coney Island, Emily Jeremy, Currents News. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.